think I'm beginning to finally feel okay. I met someone named Jesus just, well, just the other day. Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful day out there today. What a great day it is to be able to just come together and worship God as the body of Christ. Please stand. <clears throat> we know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Lord, we know you are good. And we are so thankful for that. Lord, we just come before you today to worship you and praise you. You are faithful. And we come here to thank you for that and lift your name on high. And now as people of God, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing. In my heart, there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart, there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. No more standards. I'm just getting warmed up. That's <laughs> great to be together, isn't it? Yes. Praise God. Let's take a moment to greet one another. Well, I can't believe this, but this is my last message in 1 Thessalonians. And so if you would turn with me to chapter 5. We are going to be looking at verses 8 through, excuse me, verses 11 through 28. And I've entitled today's message words to live by first Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 8 through 28 very practical section verse 11 therefore encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing but we request of you brethren that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work live in peace with one another and we urge you brethren admonish the unruly encourage the faint-hearted help the weak be patient with all men See that no one repays another for, with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. 
I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Father, what an incredible series this has been in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Not only just from its practical side and teaching and encouragement, but also in looking at that great day that is coming, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom even here at the end of his letter, Paul mentions once again. And with that great anticipation and excitement, again, Lord, we return to your word on this Sunday, seeking again the anointing, guidance, and teaching of the Holy Spirit, that we would receive a word from you, Guide now and direct, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was thinking upon this passage this last week, these questions came to mind. Beloved, what does a godly life look like? If God really has a hold of my life, then what reputation am I likely to gain? Over the years of my own ministry life, I've had the joyful, very joyful experience of coming alongside of many younger men entering the ministry. And as many of you know who've heard me preach over the years, unfortunately that was not my experience when I entered the ministry. And it's become a real conviction of my heart. I have a real desire in my life to to be an encouraging mentor uh, to help those that are entering the ministry so that they too can be fruitful. Oh, how I was blessed this last week to receive a number of text messages from Chad and Emily. You know, Chad is pastoring now up in New York State, and he was with us for but a year, but God used that year to work in Chad's life. He's a, he's a great preacher, and that's why I'm also excited to have Nate join the ministry staff here at the church as our assistant pastor. You might not know this, but Nate, graduating from Frontier School of the Bible, was offered a senior pastor position. I think it was in Nebraska, if I'm correct. But he decided, despite being offered that position, that he wasn't ready. And you know, I really admire that in him. I also admire the fact that Nate and Kelby have ventured out here to the promised land. <laughs> <laughs> and I must tell you, sight unseen, just like Abraham. They've never been here before. Isn't that true? That takes faith, doesn't it? It also just takes courage, too. Now, beloved, if I could add here a bit of my own dry sense of humor, please do not misinterpret Nate's arrival as a sign that I have ordered my casket. <laughs> it is true in my boyhood hometown, I do have, Linda and I both have a cemetery plot on a grassy knoll with southern exposure and a tree close by, but truly I am looking forward to entering my 14th year of ministry here at Grace Calvary. I look forward to the years to come, Lord willing, of seeing Nate grow into a godly leader, just like our former youth pastor, Casey, who now, of course, with his wife Valerie and boys are missionaries. You know, Casey served here for about seven years here at the church, and the Lord used all those years in growing him in grace, and boy, are they just flourishing in the land of Vanuatu. And that's also why I want to thank our own church family and those who support the ministry of Grace Calvary. I want to thank you for allowing us that opportunity to raise up younger men. I think that is so important uh, because that's just another spoke on that great gospel commission wheel. And I'm excited today about today's passage because today's passage flows 
just like enjoying a, a nice cold drink under my new awning in the backyard shadowing me from the hot sun. The Apostle Paul that we're going to discover today had an enormous pastoral heart. I imagine it as big as the Grand Canyon. And I believe that more than anything else, Paul loved people. People, in this case, who had come to faith in the city of Thessalonica. Paul was a shepherd at heart. And his desire was to see that flock of gods grow in grace. And so today, what I've decided to do is just to allow the text itself uh, to take us on this journey, so to speak, like maybe getting in a river boat, canoe, or one of those other boats, and who knows, like where it gets, what do they call those things where it gets kind of crazy? A kayak. Maybe today's message will feel like a kayak message, I don't know. But beginning in verse 11, as Paul turns to practical matters at the end of this letter, and there's many imperatives within this text. The first imperative that he says to these believers in Christ is be an encourager. And I could add to that, rather than being a discourager, the text states, therefore, encourage one another. In my late teenage years, back in the day, I would go down in my parents' basement where we had a black and white television. Remember those days when the TV used to flip? Yeah. Yeah. And you would have to, younger people don't, you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? But you would have to play with that little thing to try to keep the picture from flipping. I, I had a friend who his parents had gotten a colored television, and I boasted to him that our TV was not only black and white, but also gray. But despite all of that, there I was on Sunday evenings, as I remember, as a teenager feeling God was already calling me into the ministry, and I would tune in to watch Dr. Stanley. I understand that Dr. Stanley's retiring. I don't know why, he's only 88 years old. <laughs> But I, as I listened to him and through that time, I remember one time specifically how he talked about in his own ministry life that God had convicted him that he was not enough of an encourager from the pulpit. And that really spoke to me. You know that Greek word for encouragement, parakaleo, it engenders the idea of calling someone alongside of you. It's the idea of putting your hand on someone's shoulder. Years ago, when I was in Scotland, I went to a pastor's conference, and I got to hear Dr. John MacArthur. And I realized people can be on all sorts of sides with him, but when I met him, and he is a tiger, if not a lion, in his pulpit, and I went up, I wanted to meet him, and I introduced myself, calling him Dr. MacArthur. The first thing he said to me was, call me John. And then before I knew it, I felt like I was just talking to a regular person, and so I dared to ask, can we have our picture together? <laughs> and he said, sure. And so I gave my camera to someone, and the next thing I knew, I felt his hand around my shoulder. And I sensed that it was genuine, that it was a man who truly loved other pastors. That's the picture that Paul's drawing here. He's saying that we need to be the kind of people in our Christian lives that encourage others, come alongside of others that would be blessed because we come along, we put their, our hand on their shoulder. I know right now with all the physical distancing sort of things, I remember in my early days of ministry how my own mother said, now when you go to visit people, especially elderly people, they appreciate it if you'll just lay your hand on their hand as you pray with them. And I used to, pra I would practice that through the years. And I could see, you know, touch is very powerful. 
very powerful. Question is, how about yourself this morning? In character, how do people know you? Would they say that you are an encourager or a discourager? In the second half of verse 11, Paul then goes on and gives another imperative. He says, be someone who builds others up. And we could add, rather than tear people down. The text, of course, says build up one another. And the thing is that for whatever reason, I don't know why this is in life, but sometimes we might find ourselves in conversation when talking about someone else. Has this ever happened to you? Talking about someone else and you begin to realize that you're not building that person up, but instead you're tearing them down. This summer I've taken on the project of building a new shed in our backyard. It's become a rather lengthy project. <laughs> Thankfully, Warren met up with me accidentally, but I would see it as God's providence in Home Depot to inform me which kind of screws I needed to use. But in order to build the new shed, I first had to tear down the old shed. Now that should be on film, because that was quite comical, but we'll just leave that there. But guess what? That's what we don't need to do in building healthy relationships. You never build a healthy relationship by tearing others down. And if I could just add by example, because many of you here this morning are married, marriage can sometimes descend into those kinds of unhealthy patterns of communication when verbally spouses begin in conversation to one another, no longer building each other up, but by the way things get said, tearing one another down. I think it's an awful thing too, if I could add this. It's especially terrible when you see them doing that in front of their own children. And I would add, even their adult children not just necessarily behind closed doors. I know, for example, and it's true, she would tell you, my wife would tell you, that when she labors to make dinner, she likes to hear appreciation for the dinner that she has made. I think that's rather reasonable. And I think that that can be applied to many things in our marriages. Are you careful about that? I remember one time knowing a guy and every time he talked about his wife, he belittled her. That really bothered me so much so that we ended having a relationship with that couple. We just couldn't stand to be around this guy because the way he talked about his wife. Well now, don't be one of those people instead Be someone who builds others up. By the way, did you notice at the end of verse 11, after Paul says, be an encourager and build one another up, he then encourages them because he says, just as you're doing. In other words, he wasn't trying to get in a dig. He wasn't trying to hurt anyone, but he was just trying to point out something that was important and relevant. And so I would say even on this Sunday, if there's anything in this text that troubles you, or perhaps the Spirit of God convicts you about, then decide to make a change about that in your life. Why, it's a great thing to have a healthy marriage and healthy relationships. Now, I must tell you, verses 12 and 13, I'm a bit vulnerable about because it does talk about church leadership. Let's read it again. Paul says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. You see why I see myself in these verses? And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. What is Paul telling us here? And I know many of you are visiting with us. You come back in the summer months and 
I often think to myself, I hope that when I send you back to your own churches, I hope some well, in some way I've helped your pastor. It's to say, we all need to be appreciative of the faithful church leaders and how God has put those people in our lives. It's the unhappy truth, and I've seen it, that there are a lot of godly pastors who exit the ministry. And one of the reasons that they leave the ministry is simply just because they feel unappreciated or torn down by others. No one's perfect. There is no perfect pastor. I'm amazed through even years of ministry how even when I started here, I, I would say to people, I'm going to point you to Jesus not to me because at some point I'm gonna make you unhappy it just may that I be that I pass your car on the causeway and you glance down and you're doing 52 and I may be sinning at 58 but nevertheless it just highlights how a pastor is not perfect yet we're to be appreciative. I know that in ministry and also just in life, it's true not just for pastors, but for all of us in our jobs and in our careers. Years ago when I was working in the plastics industry at Roman Haas Company, I got a new manager. And after just one pay raise review under that new manager, I immediately decided I'm gonna transfer and get a better job, and that's what I did. It's to say that in life, all of us want to be appreciated to some degree or another, don't we? But the challenge, of course, is that in ministry and in, in my position in church leadership, you discover, guess what? You can't please everyone all the time. You can never get the temperature in the sanctuary exactly like everyone else would have it. If you ever were to come into my pastoral office, they joke about it. Uh, some people call it the principal's office. That's an awful thing. But if you were to come in my office in the summertime, I'd do my very best to try to get that room about 69, 68 degrees. You say to yourself, that's like a refrigerator in there. How could you do that? But you see, you understand that when it's really cold, that, and because I'm in there studying, that also keeps me awake. Of course, meanwhile, on Wednesday mornings when the women are gathered on the other side praying, I could probably have it at 85 degrees in my room and I'd still be awake. They're a boisterous crowd, these women in our church that pray. But I'm so appreciative of that and I respect that. It's to say this, whether you're part of Grace Calvary or another church, do do express your appreciation for those who labor well. I'm not saying you have to say something that's not genuine or sincere, but if that person among you is laboring hard and you recognize that, then encourage that individual. I found through ministry life that when I used to stand at the door, not doing that as much these days, but when people would go out and say, nice sermon, nice sermon. Every once in a while, somebody would tell me why they thought it was a nice sermon. And I really appreciated that comment because then it, it, it showed me they were actually listening to what I had said. Well, now, in that same verse, Paul also adds that we're to love and respect those leaders in our lives for what they do and for others. And I can sincerely say from this pulpit, one of the reasons why, if the Lord allows me to stay for many, many more years, I'd love to do that. And that is to say, going into my 14th year to my own church family, I must tell you how loved and respected I do feel by this congregation. I think that's one of the reasons why we can joke with one another. And I know recently, as my wife has gone through a little bit of a health situation, we have seen so many examples of that love being poured out on us. You know that 
You know that makes ministry real joy when you're a part of a church family like that. Uh, Linda and I were laughing the other day because when we first came from Ireland where we were missionaries, one of the things we had said to one another was that there's probably not another church in America I could have pastored. Now, I won't explain why I say, say that, but that is exactly how we felt when we came to Grace Calvary. We do feel loved and respected. Uh, we're both from New Jersey. I'm a Jersey boy through and through. I grew up eating Philadelphia hoagies. And back in those days, I would love my dad, we would take my sister uh, back to Bible school. She went to school in Center City, Philadelphia. Do you remember back in those days, they used to sell the pretzels? Yeah. And in the bags on the street corners, oh, I love that. And for those of you who lean towards New York City, we love your pizza. And then of course, what do we all know here in New Jersey and elsewhere? We go down to the shore, don't we? And we tell people with a sense of pride, even though we know we have a friend in Pennsylvania, as your license plates have said in years past, yet we still don't understand why we pay the toll going in your direction. But nevertheless, we're one of those few states where someone else still pumps your gas for you. <laughs> and of course, you know, being loved and respected is felt. And it's important that truly we do that for our church leadership because oftentimes, you may be surprised, pastors fall to discouragement. They may have had a, an especially difficult week. I know living along here in Ocean County and at the beach is, is my wife's best dream. Uh, she is definitely a seashore kind of girl. Now the question is, why do you think at the end of verse 13 after saying these things, Paul then adds this little phrase. It sort of stands out all by itself, doesn't it? He says, be at peace with one another. Uh, maybe that's what I need to be reminded of, to be at peace. Do you know what happens to troublemakers? Troublemakers growing up in public school, they're the bullies. They're the problem children. And then what happens with some of them is they never grow up. The same children who used to fight and scream in school are still doing it. I don't know about you and in your own neighborhood, and I would love where we live. It's like a little oasis, our backyard and front yard, but sometimes I think to myself, what's happening in society when people take their arguments from inside their house out onto their front lawns and you can hear them screaming a half a mile away you think to yourself what's going on here and you know we don't need troublemakers in God's church we really don't and there's nothing funny about someone who goes after a pastor it's frightening. And what's even more frightening are individuals who sometimes go after pastors because they, they think that they're doing God's work. I read a book years ago, and I was deeply wounded at the time because it was after my first pastorate. And it defined people like that. It called them clergy killers. That's never left me. Just recently, I warned another pastor in our own area. You have a clergy killer in your church. Don't let him into leadership and be warned. And you know what that pastor said to me? Thank you for letting me know. I take those things seriously. I had a guy one time drag me into the men's room and tell me, you know, they're 
they're going to fire you. I remember thinking at the time, what gives you the right, first off, even to drag me into the men's room? I don't want to have a discussion over the toilet. <laughs> you catch the point. And I want to say as pastor here at Grace Calvary and being loved and respected, right now we have an amazing deacon and elder team here at this church. Yes. And I, I sincerely would tell you, I feel loved on by those guys. But great, and our church staff is phenomenal. As uh, Craig has moved back to being our administrator, Lydia, most awesome secretary any church could have, and Tony, who's always at work making sure things in, are clean and sanitary. That's a blessing. Now, when we come to verses 14 through 22, it reminded me of almost reading the book of Proverbs. You know how when you read Proverbs, you get to certain sections, and it just seems like every proverb is a different subject. It kind of flows that way. Paul in verse 14. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't quench the spirit, don't despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, holding fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Here are many examples how we can use our lives to sincerely make a difference for Jesus Christ. Verse 14 reminds us what? That out there in ministry there are many messy people. And my version, New American Standard, reads, admonish the unruly. But really, if you look at the words there, it perhaps should be translated differently because it goes in another direction. It's as if my own version might say, light a fire under those who are lazy. Another way of saying it is, in God's church, take a hold of people who just seem to be drifting through life with no aims, no goals, not even a sense of purpose. If you ask them, they couldn't even tell you that they didn't understand it. They're to live for the glory of God. You do know that's foundational to the Christian life, don't you? To live for the glory of God. One of my favorite son-in-laws, I have more than one favorite, <laughs> thanked me after I first told him he could not date my daughter until he first knew where he was going in life and came back and didn't told me later that he was thankful for that. Uh, God has more for us, doesn't he, than just drifting through life. And whatever our careers are, jobs or whatever, we never retire from serving Jesus Christ. That is something that we should do right up to the last day. And if you're pondering, by the way, about where is my life heading, why not start here? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That Christ Jesus would have first place in everything. Notice too in verse 14, encourage those you see struggling. In verse 14, step up and help those who need your help. The end of verse 14, in the process, of course, when you're involved in messy lives, what do we also need? A heavy dose of patience. And uh, why does God have to remind us of that when we're going to preach it? I had at least two occasions this last week where I got tested. And I didn't get a good grade. But nevertheless, I'm still reminded it's good advice, isn't it, when we get behind the wheel of a car. I pulled up to an intersection and I just happened to leave a gap between me and the car in front of me. And some young buck decided that it was his responsibility to rip around me. <sighs> Dan, you need more patience. <laughs> 
Resist the urge to seek revenge, verse 15. Isn't that something that we can all and struggle with? Not only to struggle with, but get in trouble with if we do do that. Really, honestly, sometimes it's just much better to let it go, right? <laughs> well, God does sometimes nail us on these things. And, and God teaches us. We still need to grow in grace, don't we? And not be a disgrace. Verse 15, so practical. Pursue what's good, not evil. Fill your life with rejoicing. How many of you like hanging around someone who is a, a constant complainer? You don't, do you? I must be careful here, but if you happen to wonder why no one hangs around you, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> Verse 17, be a prayer warrior, rather warmer. Be thankful, verse 18. Isn't there something about being around thankful people? That somehow it just makes you feel good, doesn't it? When someone is thankful rather than ungrateful. In verse 19, I, I take this very sincerely. I could develop a whole message off of it. Don't be closed off, I think Paul is saying, to the Holy Spirit. There is an aspect to the Christian life in the Holy Spirit that goes far deeper than just good books that tell us about the Holy Spirit. But there is that experience in the Holy Spirit and in life and having the presence of God living within you that's so wonderful and so encouraging. How God can be there for you in the darkness of a night in a difficult time and yet you sense his presence. Bible says in Romans 8 that his spirit testifies to our spirit. That word testifies is a communicative word, isn't it? He speaks within us to our own spirit. Even in our prayers, he helps us and intercedes for us. Paul in verses 20 and 21 also tells us to be careful not to block off, but also to discern what is a spirit-led prophetic truth you know prophesying is more than just predicting the future and sometimes that's how people have seen that but actually the prophets of the Old Testament weren't so much just speaking out the future they were just preachers they were preachers they were given words from the Holy Spirit that were convicting to people as well as encouraging. That's why, I don't know if you've ever noticed, and I picked this up from friends years ago when I pray before a message, I pray that you would receive a word from the Lord. Because as much as I uphold the scriptures as our final authority, and I most certainly do, I still think that God speaks in deep and mysterious ways. I do honestly believe that in the hearing of a message on Sunday morning, when we're preaching God's word and we're relying upon the Holy Spirit, that even in those moments, if we're receptive, we will receive something from the Lord. And I think that Paul was saying to that early church, don't close yourself off from the Holy Spirit. Also in verse 22, cling to what's good and abstain from all evil. Now, just for a moment, I want to skip over verses 23 and 24 and just aim down there at the last verses, 25 through 28. Paul desires here something else from that church. What is he's right? He says, brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I abjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul was also being vulnerable with them. He was saying to them as a leader in God's church, I'm so thankful for the ministry that I have in your midst, but I also need you too. 
just as much. And most certainly with your prayers. And as I was joking earlier, but with really a sense of seriousness, one of the things that happened in this, sometimes people say, did anything good come out of this last year? Uh, incredible things have come out of this last year. One of the things is, has been that ladies' prayer gathering on Wednesday mornings. I decided, of course, Lydia calls them the prayer warriors. I've decided to name you with a new title. You are the Worldwide Federation of Prayer and Wrestling. <laughs> And I mean that as a compliment, because churches need prayer. Whether it's here on a Wednesday or at home in your own house, remembering your church family, we all, we all need prayer. Because we do live in difficult times. I don't know why it is, and my parents watch these videos, but every once in a while my mom says, you're gonna end up in jail for some of the things you say. But right now, folks, watching this month-long debauchery on television be celebrated frankly disgusts me because it is a perversion of how God would have his creation live. That's why we need prayer. That's why our nation needs even more prayer. But do you know that despite what I just said, the flip side to it is, and therefore, even more reason for us to proclaim the gospel. Oh, that someone who is captured by sin and enchained by the devil, oh, if they only would find, come to Christ, as he would find them by his grace. Would you stand with me this morning? Because the last part of this passage is actually our conclusion of our entire study. Let's pray. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For surely faithful is he who has called you and he will also bring it to pass. And now, Father, I pray a blessing upon each and every person and every family represented here today. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 Folks, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. I think I'm beginning to finally feel okay. I met someone named Jesus just well, just the other day